can you hear me? Yes. Okay, well, this is a very, very exciting group of people, probably the most exciting panel in the whole New Orleans Book Festival. <laughs> um, I cannot list all their awards and honors because it would literally take up the entire 45 minutes. So um, I'll just do sort of short intros. Maurice Carlos Ruffin has been voted the nicest person in America. <laughs> a fellow and they're right. By a fellow writer I saw interview you on YouTube. And I'm sure it's true. I can just tell. But um, his books are We Cast a Shadow and The Ones Who Don't Say They Love You. He's a former New Orleans lawyer, corporate lawyer. He gives a window on that world from his perspective and he does many other perspectives with a kaleidoscopic prowess that is just devastating and beautiful, and I can't do it justice. Um, Lewis Edwards is the author of four novels, including the long-awaited Ramadan Ramsey. He likes Shakespeare and sports, I saw on YouTube in an interview. <laughs> um, he, in that book, Ramadan Ramsey, he has kind of a gargantuan Rabelaisian appetites and curiosity and abilities and exuberance, um, which he, it's uh, with fluent brilliance that is just, it's a spark of divine fire there. Um, Lady Hubbard was born in Massachusetts, raised in the U.S. Virgin Islands, lives in New Orleans. Um, her books are The Talented Ripkins, The Rib King, and her new book, The Last Suspicious Holdout Stories. And she writes about social hierarchies in the U.S., marginalization, trauma, difficulties, people who never have a place at the table, um, told in a very unflinching way with architectural aesthetic and emotional restraint, artistic discipline that makes it even more compelling. Um, and Katie Simpson, <laughs> Am I doing okay? You're doing great. <laughs> um, Katie Simpson Smith, author of The Everlasting, that's the current book, and um, three or four other books, including her first book, We Have All Raised You, Motherhood in the South from 1750 to 1835. Um, she's from Jackson, Mississippi, lives in New Orleans, and the current book, The Everlasting, is set in Rome over 2,000 years of history. Um, what are the common threads? I think she has said time, love, and fear. I'll just have to requote myself, which she brings forth with fluent brilliance. And um, so my first question is going to relate to the amazing feat that they have all performed. But as to myself, I have been voted the only person in America who is not on social media <laughs> because of my age. <clears throat> and the last panel I was in in New Orleans, a book panel was 20 years ago, and I was literally sobbing during the panel, and I'm hoping that this one goes better, <laughs> but it could happen. Um, so my first question. Um, the amazing thing is the way you get inside other people's heads. Um, we're just going to go around the table so no one gets, you know. Um, Lewis Edwards, for example, gets in the heads of a lovelorn pregnant teenage girl, a Catholic matriarch with nine children by nine different husbands, and a newborn baby. So, that happened. <laughs> my question is for everyone, but starting with you, oh, Lewis, yeah. how do you get in there? Have you always been able to do it, to get in all these other people's heads? Is it a thing you had to cultivate? or And is there anyone's head you think you could not get in? And does it take gall, or do you just know what's in their head? And et cetera. I'm good at getting head, <laughs> I'm going to say, uh, <coughs> to use your terms. Uh, <laughs> But getting into heads, I, I think, uh, is a kind of natural thing for me. And it starts with language, which, uh, since I was a child, I had a deep appreciation 
and affection for language. It's very sensual uh, to me. It's titillating. It um, is the way to meaning, as, as best I understand it. There are people who, who get meaning in other ways, but for me, sometimes I don't know what I think, feel, until it's articulated. And so I, I reach for the characters in that same way. And in, it, I could do anything if, if you're coming from that place and you'll sit still long enough you could do you could do anything at least i feel that i can i mean so. in your own in that book you say he hadn't yet learned most never do that if you care enough about people you can read the human heart so wow. maybe that's one way of yeah. doing it yeah that's shocking that i said <laughs> no it's not <laughs> next oh i you know i i was always an extremely shy person and i loved imagining i was someone else so in, it, I think in, if I had any training, it was from, um, I loved acting when I was younger. And so I, I acted a lot. And so literally tried to embody other people, do you know? So I feel like that helped. So, but it's kind of a natural instinct. I like to pretend I'm other people. <laughs> I just think it's such a feat. Who are you right now? <laughs> <laughs> Well, by the way, with Katie, she gets in the head of, uh, just so you know, uh, am I going to find this? Just so you have a slight taste. Okay, early Christian child martyr, a medieval monk, a Medici princess of Moorish descent in 16th century West Indies, and a scientist in Rome. So mm. how do you... I have a very similar experience as Lady. Mm. Um, I grew up really shy also got into acting, weirdly, which is not something that people think about for introverts, um, but it is a way of masking. It makes sense. I yeah, think. it does. Um, but I also like the word that you use, Nancy, which is gall. Mm. Um, and I think maybe as an introvert, as someone who feels on the outside of social situations, either within your own family or in friend groups, um, the only kind of act you can make to uh, assert yourself to empower yourself is through that imaginative leap. Um, and it does feel dangerous and it does feel very um, brave in a way. Um, and then the, the miracle at the end of it is that you have all these characters that you get to interact with um, that you yourself have, have played God and created. I just really like people a lot. Um, so Shout out to best-selling author Farrah Roshan right there, to my student Maggie Schaefer, to um, <coughs> filmmaker and actor and Professor Henry Griffin, to my friend, we, we work together as lawyers, Wendy Stark, um, to so many people out here in the audience that I can barely see because my eyes aren't as good as they were, but I also see Chris Ramagera, wonderful writer and poet, Ben, Dr. Ben right there next to him. Sheila, I just met Sheila. Sheila just signed uh, with an agency, so it's gonna sell the first book soon. I love people. Give her a hand. She, she sold the book. Um, and also, shout out to uh, my friend Emily said, say hello to Chris and Tanya. Where are you, Chris and Tanya, out there in the audience? Hello, Chris and Tanya. Are you librarians? Okay, just curious. Okay. And to Chad, the sound guy, thank you so much for keeping my mic working. Um, so that's it for me. Like, I have to say, you know, when I was younger, and, and this, is, this is true, I, I wasn't very good at understanding people when I was a child. And even through, like, college, I just... I was always bewildered by people. If I read a story and I was in English lit class, I didn't understand what it was about. You know, why are they doing these things? They would ask, and I could sort of fake it a little bit. This is why they're doing this. But at some point in my like late 20s, early 30s, I started to go, oh, now I understand why people have these certain motivations, that we are so separate and different. And once I figured that out, it became a thirst. So that now when I sit down and write, I want to engage with that. You know, I want to see people who are not myself, I want to put them onto the page. And so if I'm writing my collection, which has 19 different short stories in it, to me, the great joy is kind of thinking, well, what is it to be, I don't know, a 42-year-old uh, black lesbian lady in New Orleans trying to make her way through life, you know, driving Uber, you know, being a waitress, uh, you know, working in hotel rooms, you know, cleaning things up. To me, that's just, it's, it's, it's fun, and it just feels really nice. And I have to say, I told them this, you know, being separated for so long, this is my first, like, real big public event. You all smell really good. I really like that, so, all right. But would you be able to get in the head of a lawyer in one of the firms you used to work for? 
they don't have souls. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, no. So I saw Wendy over there nodding. I'm sorry. No, I mean, certain characters are more difficult. For me, it's not that I can't get into anybody's head. Because when you asked the question, my first thought was, who could I get? Okay, maybe not Trump, maybe not certain politicians. But when I thought about it, I could. The question is, do I want to? And that's the most important thing to me. And so, you know, life is finite. And you know, maybe I can write 10 more books, 20 more books, 30. If I'm pushing it really hard. That's 30 main characters in novels. I'm not going to give the center stage to people I don't want to think about. So, you know, you all are great. I'd write about any of you in this room, including Dr. Wild, who I met a few minutes ago. Surgeon, lung surgeon? Lung surgeon, right? I was a medical malpractice lawyer. I love doctors, <laughs> right? So, exactly. Yes, give a hand to, to, to the lung surgeon. So, 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 you know, it's just this whole feeling like I would write a book about a lung surgeon because they're trying to protect life and make life better for us. But there's enough of us in the world, was it, 7 billion humans? There's probably like 2 billion. And I'm like, you know what? You, you can do your own thing. Yeah. Well, maybe you also just have to be kind of relaxed to do it, because I can't get in anyone's head. I'm just trapped right here. Mm -hmm. That's it. What, you, what kind of a child were you? <laughs> do you want to lay on the couch and explain this to me? <laughs> you know, so I'm just mystified by that. They're just lines I can't cross. But maybe if you're just kind of more relaxed about it. Well, it's, sometimes it's, it's really in the service of the story, right? Um, so in the book that recently came out, that uh, Ramadan Ramsey that, that I put out, I'd never written a villain, mm. right? Which is a very different kind of thing. Mm. It's, it's different if you're writing, um, I don't know, a James Bond story. But I, but I was writing a story about very real people, and there's going to be a villain. Uh, in the household. <coughs> Who right? was the villain? I forget. Because there were so many Kinda, characters. Can I, can I say? You've read the book. Should I just say it? It's, it's the little boy's aunt. Um, and uh, it's, she's in the house. Right. And I had to humanize her because she's not Goldfinger. She's, she's real. And um, she's part of his life and a very important part of the story. So the necessity of a character and the humanization of that character to make the story ring true and to make people feel it, it called upon me to, um, to rise to that. You, so. prob you probably humanized her so much that she's, I didn't notice her as a villain, you know? I, but that's, I love her. <laughs> but, you know, I love her and she's horrible. But most, yeah. most villains don't think of themselves as villains. <laughs> yeah. Which is in terms of humanizing. Yes. It's an interesting yeah. thing to sort of inhabit. Right. Well, speaking of Shakespeare, he has so many villains, and I just can't bear it. I yeah. can't bear the villains. I based <laughs> Aunt Clarissa on Richard III. <laughs> That's where I, I drew up on Richard III. I said, if, he, if Shakespeare could do it, uh, and, and posit the idea of Richard doing what he probably didn't do, we don't think he did it right, uh, but maybe, uh, then I could do it. Um, so as a writer, you, you, know, you draw up on these, the things that came before you, the poetry that came before you, the legacy of all of that, and it served me well, I think. I, I love Clarissa, <laughs> a horror. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess I'll move on to my other questions. Um, there's so many of them, maybe we could meld some of them, but. What do you? What is your biggest obstacle every day to writing? Somebody else. Go Maybe first. we'll start with Maurice <laughs> this time. Oh, um, okay. Don't say this the wrong way, but my biggest obstacle to writing is you all, like being here right now. So my book, my first book, came out in 2019, and you know I had this whole hero's journey. I started out as a, a corporate lawyer representing insurance companies trying to stop people from getting there flood money from Katrina, right? And it was this horrible situation that was very depressing. And I wrote that book and, you know, publishing is difficult, trying to get something out into the, into the world, get good marketing behind it. And so that happens and it's an explosion for me. I can tour the country. I went to, you know, New York, California, Florida, Belgium, you know, uh, Amsterdam. And I can't write during that. I'm having so much fun I can't write because I'm seeing people and interacting and, and learning new stories and finding out what's happening in the world. 
Then the pandemic happens, which for me was a, actually a great blessing. Um, if you were there at uh, Grisham's thing last night, you know, John Grisham gave this fellowship to Ole Miss for writers. And for the last 30 years, they've had, you know, many writers come through this program. I was the person during the pandemic year. So I'm in Grisham's house on top of a hill surrounded by two ponds in a forest and a fence by myself for the most part for about nine months. I got more writing done in that period than ever before. Um, I don't drink coffee because I'm already too excitable, right, <laughs> as you can tell. Kind of like in um, that little comic Asterix, the little Viking dude. Remember his friend had like fallen into the vat when he was a little kid, so he's already huge. So he doesn't like drink the, 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 the strength potion. So I don't need extra energy. So when I'm not around people, I can get really calm in this sort of meditative state and write as much as possible. So now I'm thinking about how am I going to navigate being back in the world, you know, being amongst people and having these enjoyable experiences. I mean, that, that, that being said, I needed to write, um, but also it is a struggle. So, you know, how will I deal with it? We'll see next. Uh, keep your eyes peeled for my next book in 2050. All right. Was he, was he an extrovert as a child? Maybe so? I, I was not. I was not. Okay. okay. <laughs> not an extrovert or not he's an extrovert? He's an extrovert now. Yes, he's an extrovert now. <laughs> um, my greatest obstacle to writing um, is related to what Lewis said about uh, the need to articulate and that thoughts don't even appear in one's head unless one expresses them in language. And I cannot conceive of a book project unless I'm in the act of writing it. So if I'm writing a sentence on a page, it makes sense to me, I can conceive of the next sentence. But if I am five feet away from my computer or in a different room, I think I'm never gonna write again. Um, and there's so many you know, obstacles to actually sitting down at the page that that, is a, that has been a huge barrier for me. Um, so I need to work on just putting myself in the place where words are coming out and then trust that once the words are coming out, I can, I can ride them until the end of the wave. I have three kids. <laughs> I, have, I have three children. So my, my issue has always been time, like literally time during a day. So I just kept getting up earlier and earlier in the morning. So, but yeah, so try, trying to mediate all of that has, has been the biggest challenge for me. Do you sleep? No, not all enough. Right. <laughs> not nearly enough. Okay. I, I just wanted to point that out because um, years ago I read a book. It was a book of interviews by authors who are uh, mothers. And I was so impressed by like that dedication. You know, I was like, look, if, if, if you can do it, I can at least try. Well, you, yeah, you have to, um, it, you have to, it has to be something that, that it is truly a part of who you are to, to figure it out. That's how I feel. And it's true for a lot of people. It's true for How old people. are they? One is 21. Right. It's still, here. it still happens. Though. Yeah. 16 and nine. They still interfere. 17 and nine. Them. I'm sorry. He just turned 17. Yeah. 21. Terrible. So you're all the same age. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. I had her at four. Right. <laughs> Ditto, ditto, ditto. I mean, it's all a variation of uh, where do I find the time, uh, which in and of itself can be inspiration, mm -hmm. to Katie's point. Just having that time, the luxury of it. Um, I have a day job, <laughs> which is like three children. Mm -hmm. um, the, yeah. the, the job that I have is like three children, yes, at least. <laughs> so um, yeah, so it's, it's a variation of that. Uh, writers. I think would want to be in a room alone for months at a time. And yeah, look, yeah. <laughs> Here I did. So lockdown, right, yeah. for us was a luxury. Um, although you had, <laughs> you had company. <laughs> I had no company. Um, and I had a manuscript that was done, but that needed editing. So I was talking to Maurice about this earlier, and I said, so I, I, the book is beautifully edited, <laughs> right? Because I had months to just, I mean, it's so tight. I mean, it's just tight. You know? <laughs> because of the luxury of, the, of, the, of having the time. And I hadn't had that maybe ever. Tight, but still Rabelaisian and gargantuan in its scope and appetites and stuff. Um, and, and sometimes, like with Lady writing about such 
profound and horrendous subjects of injustice and portraying that is maybe by portraying some of the obstacles, it's, I mean, is it, um, what do you think the impact will be and do you think about what you want the impact to be? Of, of what I'm writing? Uh, yeah. Uh, no, I think sometimes it's working through it. So it's, it's generally the things I write about, there's something very liberating about finding a voice and finding a specific structure to express something. It's a form of maybe working through things that uh, upset me or concern me or move me in some way. Um, but I no, I don't. Maybe I, I don't. People ask me that, and I'm, I'll be honest. I don't really think about <laughs> what other people will yeah. think of what I wrote. I, it's, right. it's hard to write that way for me. Yeah. It's hard to be self-conscious about it and write that way. Mm -hmm. So I write. I tend to write about things that, that I care about or people that I care about or things I wish I understood better. And, uh, and, and the writing itself becomes a way of like working through it. Well, um, I don't know, maybe it, there's inspiration in the title of this panel, so, or when did you first feel the spark or recognize that, and is it a need or is it a compulsion or is it a... To write? Yeah. Um, We've got to preface this properly. So, I love all these people up here on this panel because they're such great artists and great authors, but I had only heard of you in legend, because yeah. as you said when I finally met you today in the green room, yeah. you're from an earlier generation. Yeah. And so on this whole point about like, why do we do this? Like I asked him, I was like, you took a 20 year nap basically in writing, what brought you back? And then you said, what? <laughs> you, you said because- I was eating fruit, I can't remember. <laughs> you, you said because you're a writer. You said because right. you're a writer. Yeah, that the reminder. I, I reminded myself in that moment and forgot immediately. But yes, uh, I am a writer. But uh, from the beginning, yes. There's the language thing. I can still remember being in the sixth grade and the teacher standing at the blackboard diagramming sentences, right? This for me was an out of body experience. <laughs> I could not believe it. It was it would be like a musician first seeing, you know, the the notes on the staff, right? That's what I was oh my God, my head exploded. Right? And I've been gone ever since. So so that was that and uh, I just love all that. But then the storytelling is, is a different piece for me. I, I conceived my first novel when I was in college at LSU in just some random morning moment. I'm in graduate school, and there's just this moment, and it was flighty, flighty, flighty. A guy's going to have an experience, and then he's going to remember it years later, and his whole life will have been in that moment. So I wrote this novel called 10 Seconds in a year, from 23 to 24. It would be published when I was 29. It would take a while. As you say, it takes a long time. But whoom. So that was, that was the moment of inspiration. And uh, that, that's, I haven't stopped, really. Even in the 20 years, I continue to write, but uh, not publish, which is hard. Yeah. Publishing is hard. You know this, Nancy. Yes, yes, I do. Well, I'm, what was the, I'm sorry. You got the question. It's yeah. about inspiration. No, it's about yeah. inspiration when did to you be a first, writer. When did you yeah. first feel it? Like, as a writer. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I, I've always written. I've always written. I'm, I'm not a very professional person in terms of my approach to, to writing I, or where it comes from. It's just, I've, it, I've always written. And honestly, it, again, the three kids, at a certain point, um, I feel like I, I operate in service to my need to write because I, I, publishing is hard. I'm, I would like to be able to keep writing. So, yeah. It's a rationale for a lot of the things I do. True. That probably sounds very backwards, but it is. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I echo your experiences, both of you. And also, I will add that being a reader mm-hmm. um, at a young age mm-hmm. was eye-opening in terms of feeling like not only were these authors um, changing my world and introducing me to new worlds, but also the sense that I could be in conversation with them somehow, um, which is not a very humble thought to have <laughs> as a child. But um, I, my sort of sixth grade experience comparable to yours is that my uh, elementary school librarian told me that I needed to stop reading so many books because I would run out of books. Oh. <laughs> wow. This was a dark librarian. <laughs> um, and so I thought, okay, well, then I can create my own worlds to add to these other worlds. Um, if I could be a writer, that means that people would read me in the way that I'm reading others. Um, and, and what I search for time for most of all, I think, is reading. Mm. Um, and sometimes that's a procrastinating technique, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm doing it right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if I could like have a day uh, without a single obligation, I think mm. I would first read. Yeah. You know, what I really love about this more than anything else is that every time Katie talks, your mother smiles. So shout out to Katie's mother. <laughs> shout out to mothers in general. I just, mothers in general. Mothers in general. Um, so I mean, I'm trying to think of like a moment where I, I knew that I was that, that I was inspired to finally write. But the way I think about it is that that would be really honest. Imagine four concentric circles. There's people that could write, right? There's people that actually uh, take that leap and start writing. There's people that actually publish things, and there's people that are all those things, but they have to do it. And so I think that for me what happened was there was a point about 20-ish years ago when I, I was like reading some book or some short story, and it's like switch kind of went, you could do better than this. Mm. Somebody had gifted me a, like a commercial fiction book. I won't say the name, but I've said it before and got in trouble for it. Mm-hmm. And I was just kind of like, this, this person, I mean, they made all this money, it, it's a bestseller, people are, it's on all the, the airport shelves. I'm like, I can do better than this. And so for me, the next 20 years has been about um, what does better mean to me? It's not replicating that person's idea or doing what they do. It's doing what I want to do. And I take great pride in the fact that as a literary artist, I create the kind of books that would not exist if I didn't exist. And so that inspires me to continue forward. And he is, you are so literary. I mean, that's, that was the word that sprang to my mind when I was reading Lighting your words. short stories. That I love that. But, um, I guess this leads to my next quite generic question, but is there a certain author or a person relative who inspired you at the beginning of your embarking on this enterprise of writing? I was thinking when you were talking about reading, because it definitely, and I've told, because I had this, because I, um, it was Toni Morrison, and she was, at, and I only wrote poetry before, I was, and I was always, telling people that you were talking about being in dialogue that so I was like 19 and I was obsessed with the idea of her reading one of my bad poems <laughs> they weren't bad she was she taught I was at I went to Princeton and she taught there and I had never even read her before I went to college because I just they I had not and, uh, and I realized I read all of her books in a summer that she published by then and I was like so just in awe, I was like the biggest fan after that. And I, I literally, my inspiration for writing fiction was to get into one of her workshops. But what I really wanted was for her to read one of my poems. <laughs> it, like, it was like anything. And I was telling someone the other day, it's funny because I was so young. I wasn't very, I mean, you know, whatever, I was very young. But um, I had nothing better to do at that time except chase her around. So, but yeah, so. And she did read. Stuff. Yeah, and then yeah. she blurbed your book, right? She yes, she, yes, she, she did. She was she she was my thesis advisor in college. Jesus. But that was that was a <laughs> that was a dogged pursuit. That was a dogged pursuit. I'm not jealous at <laughs> all. Okay. No, no. <laughs> not at all. Well, no, but in terms of inspiring me, definitely, I'm I'm I was definitely inspired. Wow. Yeah. Good. And you were just talking about. Oh no, yeah, yeah, we were, and you didn't. I mean, would oh, you say yeah. Shakespeare for you or someone no, else? No, um, it's Virginia Woolf. Yeah. yeah. Um, when I had that 
silly idea that was just floating in the air. It's a very Wolfian thing. The idea is out there. You try to bring it in. <clears throat> I, I, um, I'd been reading Wolf, um, Mrs. Dalloway in particular, but all of those, those novels of that era for her are just the waves, I mean, to the lighthouse. Okay, I mean, yeah. So when I decided I was gonna write a novel, um, I, I thought I'd read other, you know, of the stream of consciousness sort of writers, whether it's Faulkner, or whether it's James Joyce. So I, I decided, yeah, that, that was the inspiration for that moment and that boy wolf knocked me out and turned me out. <laughs> so my first novel was really trying to, to take some of what she was doing with language and bring it to a new subject who, who had written such a book uh, about a black man. So I did that. To your point, nobody else was doing it. So I wanted to read that kind of book. And uh, it, was, it was a pretty cool experience. And it got me going as a writer, as a novelist. I think I might have heard that you are writing a kind of a Mrs. Dalloway. Yeah, I'm having a lot of fun with this because if you don't know Again, I didn't know I didn't know Mr. Edwards at all, but um, I reviewed his book for the New York Times back in August, you know, and I was like, this this is amazing. I didn't see this book coming at all. I mean, it's just the language, the tightness, it, it's just amazing. But to hear you say Dalloway and Shakespeare, I'm like, of course, right? Yeah. But my current book is inspired very much by um, Virginia Woolf. I, I love everything she does so much, but, but, but my overall inspiration, really, to be honest, is Nabokov, and the reason why he's such a he's a wild cat. He is a wild, wild, wild cat. I mean, in all of his books, he's always doing things with language and concept that most writers would like sort of just steer away from. It's just a little bit too, you know, um, so whether it's Humbert, Humbert, and Lolita, whether it's Pale Fire, whether his autobiography, in his autobiography, he starts off with his own birth. Like he's like witnessing his own birth. He's like in a baby carriage at like, you know, two days old, watching himself rock. I'm like, who even tries that? And so when I started reading him, you know, about 15 years ago, I'm like, all right, okay, this is like your, your spirit author. Like, keep this guy in the back of your head because, because you have to know yourself. So I was being honest when I said I was not an extrovert. Mm -hmm. And that lack of extroversion was holding me back for a very long time as a writer. There's a lot of people, look, I would be amongst that group of people who want to write but don't write because I, I just, I didn't feel like I was worthy of it. And so people like that, whether it's a, uh, a Beyonce or a Toni Morrison who wrote at 39 her first book or a Kanye West or whoever you want to name, I need that sort of energy to break out of my own inertia. And so for me, Nabokov is like the perfect version of that. This is a man who came you know, from Russia. He had a fortune. He lost it to the revolution. He went to France, went to Germany. He's being hounded across Europe. He goes to New York. He starts teaching. He's writing Russian books. They're not selling but like 500 copies of pop. He's studying butterflies at a museum in New York City and finally decides to go to English. And that level of like dedication and pursuit is what gets him to be smart. We know his name now because of that. And so I need that in my life. Who's your genius? Oh, <laughs> my literary genius is probably Eudora Welty. Uh. Um, and interestingly, you know, I read her a lot growing up because we were from the same town. Um, and she actually lived in my house when she was a little girl. Wow. Oh um, but I never really appreciated her writing style until I got older. It's, it's wackadoodle. Um, but I think for me, the fact that there was a young woman from Jackson, Mississippi, who, you know, went away for a little while, went to New York for a few years, but came home to Jackson, Mississippi and lived in the house with her mother and died in the house with her mother, um, that there was a kind of humility about that writing experience, that li literary life, um, that was very compelling to me as a Southern girl. Um, yeah. Wow. We're, yeah, we're opening so. it up to questions from the audience now. But it is, I do think there's a balance between the solitude and maybe the extroversion or being out in the world, you kind of have to be a total genius to just sit alone in your room and have it all come from here, you know. But, but we're taking questions from the audience now for the individuals. Yes? All y'all are brilliant writers that everybody <laughs> appreciates. And all of you. And yet, here you are writing this great stuff and you got these dang editors <laughs> no one knew what's right and wrong. How do you deal with that? It's hard. How do y'all deal with that? <laughs> 
first of all, thank you for making the rain stop. Your smile is like, <laughs> you just knocked out all the clouds. So I appreciate that. I mean, for me, I have to say, I didn't know what to expect as, as a new writer coming into the world. And, you know, Sheila, this is for you to, to maybe help you out a little bit. Um, first of all, I didn't know that, there, that really good agents edit also. So my agent, PJ Mark, at Janklo up in New York, he was like, yo, we're going to sit down and go back and forth mm. a few times over this. And he, like, tightened it up, you know, to Lewis's point, tightened it up. And then my first editor, Victory Matsui, who was at my book release a few years ago, like, I, put it like this. If, if you were going to go on television, you want a team around you, like, to make sure your makeup looks proper and your hair looks good and your clothes are fitting right. To me, that's what they have been like in my life. Without them, like, I thought I was hot. Like, I th I'm a genius. That's what I think, right? <laughs> but, but. They kind of go, look, okay, maybe you are a genius, Maurice, but look, how about that missing comma right there? Or like this weird clause that doesn't quite fit into the tone and rhythm you were doing. And then stepping back and going, oh, they're right about that. So I love good editors. I mean, they make it possible. I don't love the editors. <laughs> uh, and I've had very different editing experience, experiences with each of my books. And my favorites are when they just say, add a comma, take away a comma. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's hard. It's hard. To, oh, are we taking the net? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, question for Katie. So, on the topic of world building, um, you take the emergence of science fiction, say, in the 1920s. Um, now we're 100 years in the future. If you were going to forecast a whole other literary world that was going to emerge that isn't really present in, in current uh, literature. What would that world be? Hmm. What a question. <laughs> what world would I forecast? You mean like a literary genre that would develop? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to cheat a little bit and say what I would want it to be rather than what I think it's going to be, which is a kind of time bending that collapses time. Mm. So rather than science fiction that, that attempts to project a new reality or historical fiction which attempts to recreate an existing reality, pre-existing reality, a genre that allows for an awareness of a kind of circular time, um, that things are always happening simultaneously, um, and that the things we are reaching for and reaching back for uh, can exist in the same moment. And I don't know how you do that mm. structurally. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's what I've been attempting to do, for <laughs> sure. Um, but I think failing to a certain degree. I don't think I'm there yet. Um, but it's what I'm interested in. Yes? Um, in the last discussion with the, the agents, um, they mentioned that selling the author was almost as important as selling, or more important than selling the actual work you do. And that got me thinking about as a writer, did you all was it conscious of trying to sell yourself, or did it kind of come with what you're doing, or do you want to talk about that? Lady, you love selling yourself, I'm right? So, I was like, Maurice should answer that. Because <laughs> I'm so bad at selling. I'm not good at it. I'm, I'm not good at it. So that's that's interesting. It's, I should probably write that down. Cause <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, look, not only is Lady a genius, just, just like Katie and, and Lewis as well, but like, I, there's a category of writers that I think of is like, mysterious and I put you into that and that's its own marketing thing mysterious I think so I, I think so I mean I look look at me I can't be mysterious right <laughs> so because I can't be mysterious I'm on you know the gram and TikTok and and you know Twitter and doing these things because this is this is what works for me you know it's sort of back and forth of, of, of energy so you know I, I do think that definitely if you don't define yourself the marketers will define you you know because up there in New York like, they see the South, they kind of go, all right, the South, you know, get the banjos out or, you know, get, right? So it's like, all right, you're not going to define what I'm doing. I'm going to tell you how to market me and tell you what I want to be perceived as in the world. Hmm. Take all your advice from <laughs> uh, you, Right. I, sh I, I should have known you 20 years ago. Uh, I'm a tough sell. Uh, <laughs> unmarketable. Uh, <laughs> uh, every book is very different. What do you do with such a thing? And it, that's why it took 18 years to get another book out. So, uh, but it's, it, it's OK. So I had to do what I felt in each moment. I think it would be really bad for me to try to be Maurice also. Do you know what I mean? Like, if it's not natural to you, I, I don't know. 
I mean, in terms of selling right. yourself. Like, I think it would not be good for someone to be, try to be something they're not, mm. which is actually what the advice I received from my agent. As of, I don't know what was said on the panel. And I, I appreciated that advice, because it's true. I think it would be, I, I can't really try to be someone different. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just hard for shy, reserved people to sell themselves, you know. And it's weird. It's so strange to me because, like, writing a novel is such a solitary yeah, exactly. undertaking that um, I, it's probably it's a, a lot of introverts, I would imagine, are very attracted to, to doing that. Do you know what I mean? So Yeah. You're, but also, you're, you're both actors. Yeah. Right? You've said that. I mean, look, I'm playing a character right now. All right. <laughs> we have a, a oh, Ben. There's true. a Ben in the back with a question. <clears throat> is that Ben? Yes. I'm going to try that out. This is not an easy question to ask, but I'm going to try. Lady, I think you're absolutely right. You said earlier that most people like this happen do not think of themselves as characters. That seems especially true. It is a Mm -hmm. How does that requirement affect your ability to empathize with the actual villains in real life or the villains that live in this world that Star Wars have been to, to, to be able to recognize a flawed pattern of thinking does not mean I approve of the flawed pattern of thinking. So it's not, that, that doesn't. I, that's not a hindrance to me in terms of conceptualizing a villain or someone that, yeah. People have all kinds of, of flawed patterns of, of thinking. Good people have flawed patterns of thinking as well that don't cause as much damage and, and destruction. But I, I do think about that. A lot of people, and actually, in terms of thinking about the real world, sometimes it's more helpful to as opposed to just being like, oh, that's just crazy, to really think about what are the motivations behind this or that action, because they're often there. And if you really want to address the harm that is done, it's, it's often helpful to, to try and, and think about, literally, that flawed pattern of thinking. I find, do you know? As opposed to just dismissing it because uh, a lot of problems become so deeply ingrained that you, you can't just be like, that's crazy. That person's nuts. Which is true also, but <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think they're, they're related. I don't think there's like a contradiction between that for me. Do you know what I mean? Is that what you meant? Yeah, yes. And mm. Because we live in the age of Well, so are actual solutions. Like, I don't know about like shutting someone down, like on social media or something, but actual solutions to actual problems tend to be more complicated than, than shutting someone down. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so, I think uh, yeah. if you, you gave maybe any one of us six months in the woods, the six months that we want, we could each write a very beautiful beautiful Vladimir Putin. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Yeah, and I think one of the gifts of yes. being a writer is, is an awareness of three-dimensionality right. um, and oh, empathy awesome. for the villains, because we know what it takes to create one. Oh, yeah. It's um, a big part of it. It's, it's one of yeah. the most fun. Look, we will have you like saying Dos Padania, like, like painting the Z on your chest and being like, you know, crush Ukraine. <laughs> Just give us some time. <clears throat> Six months. We'll do it for you. Six months in the woods. Six months in the woods. <laughs> Do we have it? Okay, that's a young man right there. The, um, Miss Lemon has not talked about herself, but, but her book, Lies of the Saints, which is just one of the most joyful New Orleans books written, and particularly the first chapter, is just remarkably lofty and comical. I just think that she should be recognized. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, David. I am not worthy, though, of these. <laughs> but I think we've done it. We've done our jobs. Yeah. And
and I think we did it, and it was really a great honor. Thanks to you, Thank Nancy. You. Thank Save you. the world again. All right. Again.